uh, some viticultural aspects. I'd like, I'd like to wind up one or two, one or two before we go on with the wine processing discussion. The uh, moisture aspect we had just begun to talk about. We had indicated that the grapevine has a rather deep and extensive root system, and for this reason, it can do uh, quite well and uh, survive and, in fact, produce commercial crops in areas where plants of a shallower root system wouldn't uh, grow or be uh, satisfactory from a commercial viewpoint. The grapevine obviously doesn't know or care how the water gets to the root system, whether rain or irrigation or what have you. On the other hand, uh, it might make a difference on the quality of the water. If the irrigation water is full of salts and solids, when of course rainwater wouldn't be, then it's conceivable that uh, irrigation wouldn't be as satisfactory. On the other hand, since irrigation is controllable and can be timed uh, so that the vine is uh, watered at the proper time, it isn't as wasteful, and generally speaking, with European wine grapes, we'd rather have no summer rain as long as we were well able to irrigate properly. Uh, the summer rain is going to lead to high humidity, mold uh, growth on the leaves, on the fruit, and uh, a problem, or a series of problems. Uh, we do, of course, have some mildew, mold problems in California, which are handled largely by sulfur dusting to keep the uh, molds from growing on the leaves. So if it's humid at all, you'll have to get out and sulfur dust. And uh, as a precaution, it's ordinarily done a time or two uh, in any case. Second point with regard to water and how it reaches grapes has more to do with uh, hail and fog than actually with rainfall, at least from a California viewpoint. Hail, of course, is bad. It will scar the fruit, damage the berries, and this is likely to lead to rot. Uh, if it's table fruit, of course, it makes them unsightly, and it wouldn't be uh, possible to market uh, table fruit that had been hail damaged, whereas wine and grapes, if they didn't spoil, if they dried and fell off, say, then hail damage might not be severe, uh, depending on its intensity. Uh, on the other hand, hail is always bad. It beats off shoots and leaves and changes the vine's ability to produce sugar and, uh, as a consequence, affects the crop uh, ripening and quality and does lead to rot and insect infestation and that sort of thing. Fog and high humidity, we've already mentioned. Rain at the wrong time, unless immediately followed by drying conditions, leads to mildews, uh, rots and undesirable pathogenic relations with grapes. Wind can be a severe problem, and uh, you may or may not know and might be interested to know that the first raisins produced in California were produced in uh, Yolo County near Woodland. There used to be a winery in Woodland, and one reason that we don't have wineries and raisin making in Woodland now has to do with the wind, particularly the spring wind like we've just been having is if even more severe than uh, we have just had, uh, will break off the brittle young shoots. As they come out, they're very delicate and it doesn't take much of a, and they're very turgid and, and brittle in the uh, celery sense and uh, will break off easily. And wind then can be very damaging and we often have it. Severe wind anytime will deleaf the vine and of course that means that it can't uh, uh, grow the fruit properly. It may, if there's sand or other grit in the wind, it may scar the fruit, and the whipping of the vines is apt to scar the fruit. So all these things are bad, uh, and uh, areas that have uh, hot, dry winds often lead to raisining and, and this sort of thing, too. So wind generally should not be severe uh, in desirable grape-growing areas. And again, microclimate in terms of exposure has a lot to do with what sort of damage you'd get from wind, so that if your vineyard was on a hill slope properly disposed, you might be reasonably protected from gusty, damaging winds. Other than this sort of thing, these, the exposure and the slope, which are to some degree related to soil, soil is not a major consideration ordinarily with grape growing. The grape extensive root system, again, is a good feeder. Rather, unfertile soils will do well in growing grapes, and uh, high fertility can, in fact, depending on how it's balanced, even be disadvantageous because you may get a great big vigorous vine which doesn't produce very much fruit. Uh, so that ordinarily, a healthy vine, but not a superly, super vigorous vine, such as would be produced with high nitrogen fertility in the soil and so forth, is 
uh, preferred. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that the soil has no bearing, but I think it's been greatly overstated how much bearing it has. If you read descriptions of European wines from very prestigious areas, the Europeans, for a good, good reason, and often an honest belief, I'm sure, will t tend to say that my vineyard is the very best because just across the fence in my neighbor's field, they have a different kind of a soil and things are different and he cannot possibly make as good a wine as I can because I have that special uh, podunk loam that's just right for growing uh, grapes and I can do a better job. Uh, on the other hand, our evidence and I think the accumulated evidence of science now is that this is greatly overstated so that there are advantages over one soil over another, but they have more to do with drainage uh, and uh, uh, rather non-specific effects than they do with a specific special balance of nutrients that, uh, that might be hard to reproduce. Might give one example of a soil type that can make quite a difference. Ordinarily, uh, sandy soils are not considered terribly good for many crops because the water table tends to go down, uh, the, the water drains through the soil so readily that uh, many crops would starve for water in a sandy soil. But with the grape's extensive root system, once it's established, it may do very well in sandy soil. And there is another reason why sandy soil can have an advantage. And that is that this insect we talked about, the phylloxera, which is the root louse, generally infects the root system, at least in areas, it has a flying form which goes from leaf to leaf, but in dry climates like California, the flying form generally doesn't exist. So that in our kind of climate, it propagates by crawling through the soil and getting from one root system into the next root system on the next vine. And if you have a sandy soil, then the soil falls tightly around the, the uh, roots and the crawling along the root is not possible. Whereas if you have a clay soil, the soil expands and contracts with moisture and there are channels and cracks so that the root louse can penetrate through the soil from one root to another. As a consequence, if you have a very sandy soil, you may not have to use grafting to get your uh, root system uh, resistant to phylloxera. There are places in California where grafting is not practiced because of the sandy soil. So this gives one example where soil may be a very significant factor, but it's generally overstated, at least in the European li literature, that uh, how important a particular kind of soil is. And this brings us then to the final thing I wanted to mention was uh, cultural practices. Now, there are many things that you can do in the vineyard as a vineyard manager to control grape growing and make better wine because you have controlled the grape growing properly. I don't mean to minimize the effects of uh, proper vineyard supervision. And this, of course, is a whole study in itself. And you'll have to take uh, Viticulture 105 or 116 AB before you know uh, very much about it, I'm sure. On the other hand, I think from a winemaker's viewpoint and the wine course's viewpoint, uh, there's main, one main thing that we need to mention that you can do, and that is prune your grapevines properly. Uh, the, uh, you might say, why prune a grapevine at all? Why not just let the last year's growth uh, stay there and then it'll leaf out in the spring and you'll go ahead and grow grapes? In a wild condition, obviously, that's what had happened. Well, we've bred and selected grapevines so that they produce very, very heavy crops, uh, 20 pounds or so per vine and a small vine at that, uh, so that uh, having selected the vines for very high production, if we don't control it at all, it will produce so much fruit that it can't possibly ripen at all. So if you don't prune the vine, it'll set a great many great berries, and then at the end of the year, it'll be overcropped, as we would say, and the crop too high so it doesn't mature properly. And a typical symptom of overcropping is that all constituents of the grape are decreased in, in uh, quantity. In other words, the acid is suppressed, you have flat uh, tasting uh, juice, and the sugar is suppressed. There's so much fruit that the leaves can't produce enough sugar to properly ripe, ripen them. So that low sugar, low acid, low color, low general uh, composition, watery type fruit would be what you'd expect if it's overcropped. Now obviously this would make bad quality wine, poor quality wine, and should not be done. So you prune the vine to produce a, a suitable crop that can be ripened. Of course, thinking of it from a gr grower's viewpoint, obviously you sell your grapes by the ton, uh, 
and you want to get as many tons as you can. So you see there's a dilemma in the grower's mind. And you must set all the fruit that the vine can possibly mature in order to get a decent yield. On the other hand, if he overcrops, then he'll have uh, uh, poor composition and the winery will probably cut the price they'll pay for the grapes. And to be perfectly honest, I suppose if you're an independent <laughs> grower, the temptations are such that, in my opinion, you're likely to overcrop rather than undercrop. On the other hand, if you're a winery that owns your own vineyard, maybe you can afford to undercrop a little bit. But even there, with today's prices, you don't want to have a vine capable of producing five tons to the acre, a group of vines, and in fact only getting four tons to the acre. So that this is the biggest problem and one of the things that the winemaker needs to watch out for when he buys the grapes. He needs to analyze the grapes for their composition to make sure that they will make adequate wine and have not been so overcropped that they uh, produce uh, insipid, watery wine. Uh, and the grape grower needs to uh, keep this in mind. And this is one of the continuing problems as to how we price grape, grapes at the winery to be fair on both sides so that the grape grower gets a good return for his eff efforts and the winemaker gets fair value in his fruit uh, for what he pays for. Uh, use of bricks and acid and bricks acid ratios and certain standards for different varieties uh, have been used and are being continually improved. It is possible, in fact, if you don't prune the vine properly to get it to kill itself. In other words, the vine, so that the grower has a stake in not overcropping too much also, that it will set so much fruit that it just can't possibly mature at all and it'll try so hard that it'll deplete its winter food reserve and then any deleterious condition that comes along, the vine may actually die or at least be weakened so that the next year's crop will be reduced uh, in addition to what you might do by pruning. As a normal crop, uh, I think it's important to remember some sort of a figure, and the figure that we usually prefer that you remember in California is six tons of grapes per acre as a good average. Uh, the overall grand average in California of all grapes is about eight tons per acre. So if you take total tons produced, divide by total acres uh, in production, uh, you get about eight tons per acre. But we have high yielding grapes, particularly Thompson seedless, uh, that raise that average. So that uh, if you take only the wine grapes, I think the statewide average is about 5.3 the last time I saw the figures. So as a good average and a simple number to remember, I think six tons per acre is, is a good one to, uh, to know. And so uh, since uh, grape, you, you can get grape prices, for instance, Thompson Seedless sell for maybe $80 a ton or, or so in the last year or so, uh, then you can figure, all right, six times 80 is what I'm going to get per, 80, uh, per acre for my Thompson Seedless. Not too many years ago, they sold as low, low as a dollar per sugar point. In other words, if it was 22 bricks, you'd get $22 a ton. And that, of course, was below break-even prices for the vineyard operator. And it's lucky that didn't continue because many people would have had to go out of business if that had lasted very long. Uh, on the other hand, some varieties last year, I think the highest average was P Pinot Noir at $840, I believe it was, or maybe $820 a ton. Uh, Pinot Noir is a rather shy bearer, so it wouldn't yield the six tons per acre, but say at three tons per acre, that still would be a good deal better return than uh, say 10 tons per acre with Thompson Seedless at $80. So you see, uh, uh, it makes quite a difference what grape you grow and what demand it is held in. I think that's the main points I wanted to make on viticulture, so let us go ahead then with our uh, discussion of operations in winemaking. There may be some of you in the class that are taking the class because you have an interest in making wine at home. Maybe you've been doing it and you want to do it a little better. Uh, maybe you haven't been doing it, but you'd like to try. The first thing that I must warn you then is that without a permit, it is illegal to do this. On the other hand, it is possible to get a permit and the permits are free so that uh, there really is no excuse for uh, running any risks of being convicted and I believe it's a felony. Uh, a rather serious uh, uh, crime so considered to uh, make wine without permission. Now the home winemaking permits have an interesting history. When prohibition, national prohibition was instituted, it was at a time when we had quite a few recently immigrated uh, people from uh, Mediterranean countries that had wine at home as a major part of their diet. Uh, 
And the thinking evidently was that since we have a lot of people who think uh, of wine as a major part of their diet, if we just arbitrarily cut this off, uh, we aren't going to be able to enforce uh, prohibition. So even during prohibition, there was provision for home winemaking uh, legally with a permit, uh, and the same regulation has been essentially carried over now that prohibition has been repealed. And the regulation is uh, fairly simple, but uh, I won't go into all the details of it, but generally speaking, uh, you must be the head of a household, and you must uh, uh, have the permit, and you cannot make more than 200 gallons of uh, still wine per year, and it must be served to your family and you in your home. In fact, uh, if you follow the regulations strictly, you can't even serve it to guests. As far as I know, you, there have not been any prosecutions for having a guest and serving some of your wine, but uh, it certainly would be frowned upon if you gave them some to take home or even worse yet, sold some uh, from your home uh, production. That would be illegal, uh, but uh, service to your family is permitted. Now, 200 gallons per year is a fairly sizable amount, and uh, I guess uh, very few people would feel that they needed a lot more than that. After all, that's, what, three quarters of a gallon a day. And unless you have an awfully big family, that ought to be enough. Uh, you can't legally make sparkling wine. And in fact, you can't legally make beer or other things, in spite of the fact that you will find kits for doing such available. Even during Prohibition, there was a joke, I think it was true, that there was a can of certain kind of malt syrup that was sold that says, do not take the contents of this can and do not mix it with three gallons of water and add this and this, or you will get beer and this is illegal. <laughs> so it gave all the rec recommendations as to what not to do. The uh, permit depends, as I understand it, on being the head of a household. I just called this morning to be sure of my facts on that. Apparently, if you're a bachelor, even if you're 50 years old, you can't legally make wine at home. And I've heard Dr. Amreen uh, uh, talk about this and say that it is rather too bad that he's never quite come of age as far as uh, home winemaking goes since he didn't get married. But if you have dependents at home, I guess you needn't be married, but you have to have some dependents, and then you can qualify as the head of the household and uh, uh, get this permit. Uh, the permit is obtained from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. <laughs> you see where they throw us in with all these lovely things. Uh, uh, the Bureau is a, a fairly new entity. It's a part of the Treasury Department, but I think only one year ago became a separate bureau like the FBI and other bureaus, so that it is a separate entity now rather than just a a division in the Internal Revenue Service. So it's in the, tr if you want to find it in the phone book, they have an office in Sacramento, look under U.S. Government Treasury Department and you'll find it. And then they will arrange to get you the permit if you'd like. Uh, I don't mean to say anything funny about it. In other words, I don't mean to make such a joke. I do think it's very important if you are going to make wine at home to get the permit because I know of at least one friend who uh, didn't do this once, and some neighbors complained of some strange odors that were emanating from his garage, and uh, uh, he was uh, busted, I guess is the term these days. And uh, it, this served as an automatic felony conviction, and uh, uh, a couple of times, he's a salesman, a couple of times when he wanted to change jobs, he had a hard time explaining why he deserved to change jobs when he'd been convicted of a felony. So. Uh, you may think it's uh, ridiculous or funny, but it just doesn't pay to uh, go against these regulations, and I strongly advise against it. The uh, making of wine at home is not something we'll spend time on, and you may feel uh, abused in this regard in that you did want to know something about this. On the other hand, uh, the home winemaker needs to consider everything that the commercial winery man does consider. So if you understand how wine is made commercially, obviously you can do it at home, and the only difference would be that you might decide to cut some corners. For instance, if you're a commercial producer, you must have nice clear wine or the customers are going to send it all back and, and it won't uh, stay on the market. Uh, on the other hand, at home, you might be willing to strain it through your teeth a little bit and it wouldn't necessarily bother you if it wasn't quite so, so uh, brilliantly clear. So you might cut some corners as long as you knew which corner was safe to cut. Uh, otherwise, you need to do the same kind of thing that the commercial winemaker does, and that's what we'll talk about. 
uh, to control your fermentation, obviously you must analyze for various things. And uh, you can uh, uh, consider analyses in different levels of necessity. If you're a very big concern with several enologists and chemists working for you, you probably will want to analyze your wines and grape juices for many things to get information on uh, details that will help you in making the best possible wine out of these products. On the other hand, if you're a small operator or a home winemaker, uh, you may depend on relatively few analyses. The sensory analysis, that is the uh, observation, the smelling, the tasting of the product is one that all producers can use and the better winemakers are generally the better tasters. The man who can recognize an off flavor, I, n I won't mention any names, but I know of wineries, uh, some of whom are out of uh, business now, where the winemaker evidently didn't recognize all flavors in his own wine. He, he produced wine that he thought was all right, but the customers uh, that were sophisticated soon realized that it had some off flavor, maybe hydrogen sulfide or something of this sort that uh, they didn't care for. And if it's uh, a large part of your customers, obviously it's going to affect your business. So good tasting, uh, carefully done, preferably by more than one individual, usually blind tasting by a panel would be the best way to control certain aspects of wine, regardless of our modern chemistry, because some things we just can't satisfactorily analyze for yet. And certainly the overall integration of flavor is one of these things. Uh, then in addition to sensory analysis, there are various analyses that I might consider of primary importance. And some measure of sugar, some measure of alcohol, microscopic examination, uh, total acidity measure, volatile acidity measure, and extract might be so considered in my mind as primary analyses that you almost always would want to do. And then supplementary analyses that you might or might not uh, care to do would include sulfur dioxide. Since you add it, you might not need to analyze for it because you know how much you've added but it is generally a good idea to analyze for sulfur dioxide, both free and total, because the free sulfur dioxide has to do with how much effect it has, and that's the more interesting uh, number. So you can add it, but not much be free, and therefore you still need to add more, perhaps. And we'll talk about why you add it and so on in just a moment. You might want to analyze for tannins or phenolic substances, since these are astringent flavors, sometimes bitter flavors. You might want to analyze for pigment content, particularly red pigment. You might want to analyze for volatile aldehydes, uh, esters, the pH, which is a measure of the acid. You might want to analyze for iron, copper, calcium, potassium, sodium, such inorganic uh, elements. You might want to analyze for malic acid. If you want to know, does, has your wine had a malolactic fermentation, you run a paper chromatogram and see if it still has malic acid present. If it has, it hasn't had a complete fermentation. If it has no malic acid, it has converted it all to lactic, and that is the significance of the malolactic fermentation, or signifies that it has had a malolactic fermentation. Coming back then to a, a couple of these values, what do we mean by them? I said the primary, or one of the probably the first uh, important uh, analysis would be that for sugar or uh, something that's equivalent to sugar. And this is commonly BRICS, and we'll come to that in just a moment. The BRICS value is actually a measure of dissolved solids, but is used primarily to indicate sugar. Before I forget and erase it, I would remind those of you, I think maybe the Monday people didn't get told, uh, at least in next week's discussion group, we'll have a tour of the Enology building you should meet in the west end of Wixon Hall or in the courtyard between Wixon Hall and the Enology Building rather than going to your discussion uh, rooms. Uh, if you have any questions individually, come by and see me. But anyway, next week, instead of going to your discussion class, and particularly on Monday morning, uh, come to uh, the courtyard between Wixon and Enology. It's on the west end of Wixon for a tour of the experimental winery. Well, anyway, coming back to analyses then, the sugar analysis is related to the sugar in the juice primarily, but of course could be related to sweet wine sugar. Uh, and the other term that I use that I might need to define is extract. Uh, 
Extract is dissolved non-volatile solids left in a wine. So that if you start with so much sugar in the wine, in the grape juice you're going to ferment, and you do ferment it, then the sugar is going to convert largely to alcohol, as has already been discussed. And we, I think you've been given the figure that if you multiply the bricks of the juice by 0.55, this equals the percent alcohol by volume. Measured at a certain temperature, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, if we start with grape juice at a certain bricks and multiply it by 0.55, we know in the dry wine you'd expect so much alcohol and the sugar has converted to alcohol. But not all dissolved solids will convert. There are acids that are dissolved solids. There are certain sugars, in fact, that are not fermentable, so that you'll end up with some dissolved solids in the wine that are not volatile that would qualify as extract. Of course, it's a, if it's a sweet wine, then the residual sugar would also add to the extract. So the way we would determine extract is to take a wine sample, boil off all the alcohol and the water and things that will boil off, and then dilute it back to the same original volume and measure generally the bricks content again. And that bricks would indicate the dissolved solids that had not been fermented, and that would be the extract value. So a wine with a high extract, if it's very high, it indicates a sweet wine. If it's a dry wine, you can taste it and tell it's not sweet. Nevertheless, it has high extract, and it would indicate, say, very ripe grapes with a high extract content or winemaking practices that give a lot of solids extracted from the solid part of the grape. So that uh, extract is an interesting and worthwhile factor, and it is related to then dissolved solids, but is that left after the wine is made uh, as non-volatile dissolved solids. Now, bricks is a term taken from a man's name. Uh, I guess Brie, in fact, it, would be a, it was a Frenchman. Uh, and he recalculated the table that was originally published by another gentleman, who I imagine pronounced his name Balling, although around the wineries you're generally here as, as Balling. But uh, you'll hear both terms. We favor bricks, and would like for you to remember it that way, although you ought to know both since winemakers do use both. Uh, the bricks is more generally used. The canning industry and food industry in general commonly uses the term bricks. Now, the bricks tables then are tables made up from density. And commonly we determine or estimate bricks by using a hydrometer, which the winemaker may call a stem, which looks something like so. And the hydrometer, in fact, measures density. So if you dissolve sugar in water, it becomes more dense. If you don't th believe me, think of the fact that if you had a cup full of water and a cup full of sugar and you poured them together very carefully, you could get almost all of it in one cup. So obviously, it's going to weigh more per unit volume when there's sugar dissolved in water. So the density goes up. Now, you float this hydrometer in a container containing whatever solution it is you're trying to measure. And it will float higher or lower depending on density. If it's more dense, it'll float higher. If it's less dense, it'll sink deeper. There's a weight in the bottom, so it floats upright. And originally, when these stems or hydrometers were made, they took sugar solutions, a certain concentration of sugar, floated it in it, and then made a mark and said, OK, at that concentration of sugar, it reads so-and-so, reading right across the top of the liquid and then make another concentration of sugar and make a series of marks till you've calibrated this stem with uh, units that read in grams of sucrose sugar, that's how you calibrate it, for 100 grams of solution. So it's a weight percent value that you read off of the hydrometer, and it would range generally for grapes between zero and say 25, unless you had awfully ripe grapes or some raisins or something like that. So you'd calibrate this stem in some units, maybe 0 to 30, maybe a narrower range depending upon how fine you wanted to get the reading, and then to float it in the solution and you can measure, read directly uh, and with a temperature correction if necessary, uh, the exact uh, uh, dissolved solids content. Now, as I mentioned the other day, 
this is calibrated in grams of sucrose, yet there is very little sucrose in grape juice. Most of the sugar is an equal mixture of glucose and fructose, but that doesn't hurt anything. The reason it doesn't hurt anything is that you dissolve one gram of almost anything in 100 grams of solution, and you'll get the equivalent reading of about one gram of sucrose. In other words, total dissolved solids affect density about the same and therefore, since we're mainly interested in sugar, we use the Brick scale and express it as grams of sucrose. So we use this for a number of interesting things. We use it to know when to pick the grapes. So we want to know how ripe they are, how much sugar is present. We use the, the Brick's uh, determination on the juice to estimate that. We want to follow fermentation. And since the sugar, which is dissolved solids, is going to go to alcohol, which is a volatile material, and not only that, remember we already gave you the fact that one milliliter of alcohol weighs eight-tenths of a gram. That means the density is less than water. So as you ferment the sugar, you're lowering the density because you're using this dissolved solid, but you're lowering it even more because you're converting it to something that has less density than does water. So in fact, if you ferment a grape juice completely dry, depending on how much sugar was present and how much sugar you convert to alcohol, you may get a minus number, maybe even as high as minus two degrees bricks on the dry wine. And so following the bricks during fermentation, seeing how fast it drops and noting that it's gone to either a constant zero or slightly minus number would enable you to know the fermentation is proceeding and has in fact finished when you reach the uh, uh, constant low and probably minus value. So that uh, these are examples of the great utility of BRICS determinations. You need not determine the BRICS values uh, exclusively by a hydrometer. There are other methods of determining. Obviously, you could uh, analyze for sugar by chemical means and then convert that to BRICS values. Uh, the more useful and common way for vineyard operations, the hydrometer is commonly used in the winery because it's easy to fill a container with a pint of juice and, and drop a hydrometer in and make your readings. But as you can imagine, going through the vineyard with a bucket and squeezing sticky grape juice out and, and sticking hydrometer in and then shaking the juice off your hands and writing it down isn't the greatest way to make it through a dusty vineyard for a day or so. Uh, there is a, an apparatus that is common, or an instrument that is commonly used in the vineyard, the refractometer, which does the same thing, is com uh, calculated, is calibrated the same way, except it bases its uh, readings on bending of light. The, the sugar, the juice is put between two glasses or two prisms, and then the way the light is bent is dependent on the dissolved sugar, and again, the same kind of values, exactly the same numbers. If everything is right, you get identical number from the refractometer or for the hydrometer and uh, you get the same thing. So if you see a man in a vineyard with what looks like a little telescope peeking through it and maybe looking at the hillside and you wonder what in the world is he sighting on, he's not looking at anything. He's got a, on the hillside, he's got a little scale in there that he's reading a shadow and that tells him what is the sugar content uh, of his uh, juice. I suppose I should be careful in calling this sugar content because of course we do have the extract in addition so that uh, extract of a dry wine commonly would run around uh, 2 percent or so, maybe more depending on the kind of wine. So there's roughly 2 percent of solids in the wine or in the juice that is not sugar. But all the rest, subtract 2 from 25, 23 percent is sugar so that the Brix value is commonly considered to be a measure of sugar even though in fact it does measure all dissolved solids. Clearly, when you're at the high end and you're talking about the difference between 18 and 22, the difference you're talking about is sugar. Well, I think that's all we need to say about the analytical procedures. Uh, unfortunately, that's not uh, enough to enable you to be a very satisfactory enologist, but at least it gives you some idea of a few of the methods and, and you could visualize how others would be useful. Let's talk about steps in making wine. First of all, we have to get the grapes and prepare them for wine making. Now, in obtaining the grapes, we must harvest them. We must decide that they are ripe for harvest first. And then when we have reached that decision, we would like to have the grapes harvested as quickly and carefully as possible and get them to the winery as soon as possible. 
Now this is visualizing hand harvesting. Why do we care how quick it is? They've been there in the vineyard all this time. Does it make, what, what difference does it make if we get them to the winery as soon as we cut them off? Well, you know how an apple behaves as soon as you cut it. If you cut an apple in two and put it on the desk, I suppose I should bring an apple and do this. Certainly by the end of the period, it would be brown and beginning to dry on the surface and not look very attractive. So that uh, the same kind of reactions happen in any sort of damaged fruit, including grapes, so that any bruising, any damaging of the grapes, and inevitably some occurs, uh, will rapidly lead to browning and uh, flavor change and undesirable effects. So the, the idea then is to be as gentle as possible and get the fruit to the winery as quickly as possible so that it then can be processed and the browning and other changes will not be appreciable. Uh, we would like the fruit to be as cool as possible. So ordinarily you try to harvest it early in the morning or something of this sort uh, so that it would be relatively cool. And we'll talk about cooling the fermentation later on, but obviously if the fruit is cool to begin with, then you don't have to cool the grape juice quite as much as if it were uh, in the blazing hot part of the day. On the other hand, the loads are such on the wineries and the vineyards that we do, of course, get quite a few grapes in that uh, are picked in the heat of the day. Uh, the uh, mechanical harvesting is becoming a great deal more important and uh, will become more so. And obviously in mechanical harvesting, there's a, a different sort of situation. The mechanical harvesting, the usual type, is based on having uh, metal fingers. You have a machine that straddles the row of grapes and metal fingers come out and rather violently jerk the wires that the grapes are uh, trellised on. So that as you jerk the wire, you have this large cluster of grapes has a certain inertia and you jerk the wire and it causes it to snap off or the berries to come loose from the stem depending on the variety. Sometimes the berries mostly come off, sometimes the whole cluster comes off. Catch it in a, in a conveyor belt under the machine and elevate it into a catcher or a tank of some sort, blowing the leaves out that may come along with the uh, grapes. So that this kind of harvesting, obviously, and with certain varieties, you get a fair amount of juicing. The grapes do fall, they do hit wires, they do hit each other, and they do get bruised. Clearly the way to go and the way most people have gone or are going is then to take these grapes in the field and begin the processing right there so that the next steps are ordinarily done in the field and the next steps are destemming and crushing the grapes and adding sulfur dioxide. So ordinarily this would be done right in the field and the sulfur dioxide then would tend to prevent further change until you got to the winery. In fact, we may go further, and with time, we may have field uh, uh, pressing stations. We may begin to inoculate with yeast and start the fermentation right in the field, perhaps, uh, although this remains to be seen as to whether this would be a good idea. All right, then the next, stems from, uh, next steps from hand harvesting or uh, mechanical harvesting is to remove the stems. Why do we destem grapes? Well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, there's no reason not to. That is, the stems are not valuable, they don't contain very much sugar, and for that reason it doesn't hurt anything to take them out. Secondly, the product is easier to pump. You can pump crushed grapes, but you can't very well pump stems mixed with it. The stems are pretty stiff and angular and they block up any sort of a pump uh, as a rule and so forth. So that uh, it, it makes it easier to handle, but most importantly, if we leave the stems in during uh, pr further processing, we're likely to get off flavors. They, peppery, stemmy type flavor occurs in at least red wines, and the stems are high in tannin, high in acid, rather high in minerals, bitterness, and resinous materials, all of which we'd like to leave out of the wine. The only time that we would consider leaving stems generally in California, although there are parts of the world which still do leave the stems in, and if they want it that way, that's fine. It may be one reason their wines tend to be different. We would tend to say worse, but in any case, uh, you might have a taste for peppery wine, I suppose, that has a stemmy flavor. The only time we in California would generally, and most modern wine producing countries, uh, recommend leaving the stems in would be a very temporary situation where you're having trouble pressing the grapes or getting the juice back out. Sometimes the stems will allow you to press the grapes. They tend to mat and hold the grapes together better so that you may get a better juice yield under some circumstances if you do leave the uh, stems in. But ordinarily that would be the only time and now with better pressing methods even that is considered to be rarely a good idea.
In the process of removing the stems commercially, ordinarily, we combine the operation of crushing. Now, crushing is a bit of a strong word. You may tend to think of something being crushed, you know, as you really stomped on it and it's uh, mashed to a, a very fine pulp. We don't mean to imply that with grapes. Crushing with grapes, we mean to more or less gently open every berry. So 100% of the berries opened up would be our objective. And the reason that we want to quote crush, unquote, the, the grapes is so that either the yeast can contact the inside of the berry or we can get juice recovery from the berry. If you leave uh, 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 intact berries in a wine fermentation, then ordinarily they'll go right through and come right out still solid and uh, the juice will still be inside. So obviously that would be a loss. So that uh, the idea is to open up 100% of the berries. And if you can visualize how one might do it, there are several, but we do not want to grind the berries and we, and we don't want to uh, uh, break the seeds. If we break the seeds, we'll get off flavors, particularly high tannin and possibly oiliness uh, that will cause later trouble uh, in the wine, off flavors and bad effects. So that the ide ideal kind of crushing could be visualized as having two rollers just close enough that no grape could slip between them without being popped open, but not so close together that you'd crush the grapes. Now this would be called a roller crusher, and there are such crushers. Ordinarily, the ones we use in California are a combination called a Garola, because it was invented in Italy by Mr. Garola, or at least the Garola company produces it. Uh, the Garola Crusher Stemmer is commonly used, <coughs> excuse me, and this is a, a, a machine that has a picture in your book, so I won't try to do more than just a very crude drawing. It has a cylinder, and you'll see this when you tour the experimental winery. The cylinder is on an axle so that it can rotate, and it has slots or holes in the cylinder all over it, so that, uh, and inside on, this, on a another axle, or a coaxial, you have paddles. And these paddles are generally spiral shaped and they just clear the outside of the cylinder. Then the whole thing is covered up so that grapes won't be thrown out of it and you have a funnel bottom so that the crushed grapes will come out the bottom. So what happens is you run clusters of grapes in on this end, the paddles are whirling faster than the cylinder is turning and the paddles will knock the grapes rather forcefully against the side and most of the berries will go through the holes and in the process of doing so, the paddles will sort of wipe them against the side and they'll all be torn open. But there won't be any seed breakage because there's good clearance between the paddle and the outside. So the crushed grapes will go out and be caught in the funnel bottom and the stems will be uh, discharged out the end in another container. So our typical crushing and destemming operation is done in one move by a machine of this type. And you might look in your book at the picture. Uh, these machines can be very large in capacity. They may uh, run at 100 to 180 tons of grapes per hour, which is a pretty good sized operation. They may have a six inch pipe carrying away the juice and, and crushed grapes. And uh, this pipe is, is like a water main is full and a lot of uh, grapes can be processed in a short time. There are wineries that have several such crusher stemmers in, uh, in one installation. I think uh, as many as six, so that would mean 600 tons of grapes per hour could be processed in that sort of an operation. So it is a big operation. You must remember that grapes get ripe over a fairly short season so that you're going to have to handle a lot of grapes in a short time in order to have enough wine to sell all year. Uh, in the rest of the season. The product that you would produce from the crusher stemmer would be crushed grapes mixed with juice and this or any other preparation that is prepared for fermentation but not yet fermented is called must, M-U-S-T. So in the wine business, must is that which is to be fermented. Grape juice, if it's to be a white wine or crushed uh, grapes with juice uh, in, uh, in other cases. Uh, the crushed grapes are pumpable uh, and uh, you don't need to worry about them plugging a pump if you've got the proper types of pump at least. 
uh, and, and you process it from there on without any uh, manual operation. The removal of the stems and so forth may require a certain amount of manual uh, labor. The, uh, the associated with crushing and stemming is the addition of sulfur dioxide and we would ordinarily recommend this immediately, in fact, at the crusher stemmer if possible. So that commonly what is done is that you'd have a tank of this gas sitting on a, on a scale so it's properly controlled and as a hundred uh, tons of grape would go through the crusher, you would be metering in the proper amount of sulfur dioxide all during that operation. So we would add the sulfur dioxide in the must line or uh, immediately upon crushing. Now the sulfur dioxide does a number of things. One of them is to prevent this enzymatic browning that we mentioned on the cut apple. So that uh, is obviously as soon as you cut the apple, you've got to add sulfur dioxide or it begins to brown. The same thing happens with the grape and that's why if you're going to do mechanical harvesting with field crushing and stem removal, you need to add the sulfur dioxide there and you should keep your juice in a closed container so that the sulfur dioxide doesn't escape and so that you don't have excessive oxidation. So the early addition of sulfur dioxide is the, the earlier the better. In some places they even sprinkle it on the grapes immediately before the crusher, although uh, perhaps that's a little less controllable since some of it does run out into the truck bed and what have you. Uh, the form of addition can be several. We may add sulfur dioxide gas. You can buy the gas. It's burned sulfur is what it is. If you burn sulfur in air, you get sulfur dioxide. So this burned sulfur gas can be bought in tanks as either liquefied or high compressed uh, sulfur gas, sulfur dioxide gas. You can run that gas into water and make a 6% or less solution. And this solution may be used or you may use salts like potassium bisulfite because when you add SO2 to water, you get sulfurous acid. In water, dissolved SO2 is sulfurous acid and the uh, sulfurous acid is the salt of, say, sodium, a half salt would be sodium bisulfite. So if we had this white solid salt, it uh, looks about like table salt, but it sure wouldn't taste like it, uh, you could uh, add that salt. And for home winemakers or other people, either potassium metabisulfite, sodium sulfide, or sodium bisulfite would be sources of the bisulfide ion or sulf sulfur dioxide in wine, which is what we're after. We could burn sulfur, and this has been done in the past. For instance, if you want to sterilize a a wooden cask. They've made candles that had sulfur mixed with the wax and you look, put a burn, light a candle and lower it on a, on a little holder down into the barrel and uh, you will generate sulfur dioxide in the barrel by this means with a sulfur wick or sulfur candle uh, in the barrel. This is kind of obsolete now uh, and it's had several bad features. If any of the sulfur itself, the elemental sulfur, fell to the bottom of the barrel then it would probably turn to hydrogen sulfide and make a bad odor. The sulfur dioxide has a very strong pungent burnt sulfur odor and it's not very pleasant to work around uh, but it's quite a different odor. Burned sulfur is quite a different odor from the rotten egg gas hydrogen sulfide. So when you reduce this as does happen during yeast fermentation you get a different kind of an off odor and you shouldn't confuse the two. Either one is, is, is bad. Now we said one of the reasons for adding sulfur dioxide was to inhibit the browning enzymes. There are others. In fact, a very important family of reasons for adding sulfur dioxide. It does act as an antioxidant. In other words, it re resists oxidation because itself is readily oxidized. It inhibits non-enzymatic browning as well as enzymatic browning. It inhibits undesirable microorganisms, and I'm not sure how much has been said about this at this point, but the wild yeast, the acetic acid bacteria, the lactic acid bacteria, and all other undesirable organisms we know of in wine are readily inhibited by free sulfur dioxide and the bisulfide ion. Uh, on the other hand, the wine yeast, although if the sulfur dioxide is high enough, it'll be inhibited as well, it's relatively resistant, so in comparison to these undesirable organisms, it is favored because of its uh, relatively high resistance to SO2. Uh, 
another point is when I say SO2, listen, don't confuse it with CO2. Carbon dioxide is quite different. We drink carbon dioxide in beer or champagne and what have you very happily, but if there's much SO2, I can guarantee you won't drink it very happily. It'll make you sneeze and it won't, uh, it won't feel or taste very good. Other possible reasons for adding sulfur dioxide is that it might aid clarification and it might aid in killing cells so that you get red color extraction. However, there are problems in adding SO2 and these latter two reasons tend not to be very important because, for instance, on red color extraction, although SO2 will aid its release, it does tend to bleach the red color. So among the bad considerations of SO2 addition are bad odor, especially if excessive, uh, the bleaching of red color, uh, and it does affect composition of wine, uh, particularly raising the aldehyde and glycerol content, and it is unpleasant to work around, maybe even toxic for the winery worker. In terms of the drinker, it's, uh, we don't think, uh, serious, uh, but in terms of working in high concentration, breathing a lot of it, it is unpleasant and maybe hazardous to the winery worker. Well, I must quit at that point then for today.